Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that my band, Lorenzo's Music, will be playing at The Frequency on January 26th, 2018. We'll be playing along with local acts Boo Bradley and Negative Example. So January 26th, The Frequency, Downtown Madison. You can check out our music at lorenzosmusic.com. I hope to see you there. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. In the last episode, I introduced the people I met that either own or operate the 10 different places I'm talking to this season. They each answered a question. What made you start your own business? Giving you an idea of what it's like for the people that show or consign the work that you put out there. Plus, we've all had the idea or just wanting to think of taking our creative outlet one step further. But most of us never act on it. It's never the right time. Like, what would we do? How can we afford it? And all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to know how did the people I meet start? Was the thought process any different for them? How would you even begin? So the question this week is, when were you ready to take the leap? Laura from Anthology on State Street mentioned in the last episode using the invaluable lessons that she got from running someone else's store. And as she's going to tell you, this was even pointed out to her by her previous boss who gave her the push to venture on her own. I want to own a store of my own. It was always there. And initially it was sort of like, oh, I'll just take over this store, which is like very conceited the way that thinking was but anyway that's what I was like you know here I have this very regimented path and that's that was the next step it was clear that my ideas of having that creative component weren't they just weren't going to fit into that existing business there was like a moment where I was like I'm not going to fit into this existing business and it was like a little bit of a crisis point for me and then all of a sudden it was like you know I spent months kind of agonizing over that and then all of a sudden I was like wait you know for the last four years I've been telling everybody that I'm gonna own my own store by the time I hit 40 Mm -hmm. and maybe that's what this is all about Hmm. it happened a little bit before 40 so yay nice you made the deadline (laughs) I did make the deadline (laughs) phew So you were saying that you were originally planning to take over the previous business. I just figured, I mean, you know, I was just kind of like working my way up the ladder. Unfortunately, in small business, there's just not a lot of rungs. Hmm. Even my old boss would always say, once you've worked for me as a manager for three years, you're ready to go on your own. I've taught you what you need to know. It seemed perhaps that retirement was coming closer for my boss, and so I had a little bit of that idea of like, oh, well, I'll just take over after she retires. At the time, it felt like I was being kicked out of the nest, but there's no way I could have done what I've done Mm -hmm. if I had to start with someone else's idea and then tweak it. So you think more it was that they were telling you, you could try and change this existing thing, but it might be smarter to just create your own. I mean, it's this long-standing icon of Madison retail, Mm -hmm. and you could change it, but then you'd get all of its regular customers coming in and they'd be like, what this is different this is not what I wanted and so even if you had in some respects changed it it, for the better in your own opinion there would still be that kind of resistance to change it ultimately ended up being better that I just had to start from a clean slate whose mom teaches business for the Edgewood College and apparently has this cartoon. There's a, a downhill skier on a very steep slope looking terrified. And it's obviously a horrifying thing ahead of that skier. And then the, the panel pans out and there's like a polar bear running up behind the skier. So it's not that the, the choice of going downhill is not terrifying but the choice of staying in that mm-hmm. place is more terrifying. Mm-hmm. So like, I just reached this point where I was like, I have to do it. So it was still terrifying, mm-hmm. but I think it was just this point where it was like, I was going to lose myself mm-hmm. if I didn't do it. How did you decide it was the right time financially? Probably That's that. like having children, it's never a right time, right? <laughs> That's a There's no, answer. I mean, 
In hindsight, we were just amazingly lucky because it was basically late fall of 2007 that I was transferring funds. Our parents gave us, you know, some seed money yeah. and we got our bank loan and all of that was happening late 2007, January 2008. And if we had waited another year, even though we had a very small bank loan, we might not have been able to get it. It's like the financial, national financial picture mm -hmm. got suddenly more dire. Even though it seemed like we were taking a tremendous risk, it was actually like the best moment for us to to do lucky. what we did. It was lucky. Was it just a small business loan or? Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. But it was so small that we didn't even have as many hoops to jump through. And I feel like in another year, we would have had many more hoops to jump through and everything just tightened up because of the financial situation on the national scale. And do you have to so. explain what you're going to do with it or did they just go, oh, here's yeah. a small business loan? I mean, you do have to explain. My sister was pregnant in 2007 and so she had a brand new baby in the wow. fall of 2007. And you still decided to do this. <laughs> and so she had the baby in September and I realized I was going to leave my job and I thought I'll just like go get some job to fill the time yeah. and after the baby has grown up a little bit then she and I can open the store because it's something we had talked about. And then it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and I woke up at like 6 in the morning and I was like Oh, we're going to open that store. So, yeah, and I mean, I'm talking about this as me, but we're like, my sister and I are definitely 50-50 partners in yeah. this whole entire project. The only thing that's imbalanced is that I'm the bossy older sister. So, like, every <laughs> once in a while that comes through where I'm like, you know what, this is what our dream is going to be. But, yeah. you know, she's basically thrown herself into it, and I think for her creatively that this has been a really good outlet those first two years that was totally overwhelming and stressful but it was still not as stressful as my end of my last job okay. because the end of my last job was me kind of questioning my worth did I put, go on the wrong path should I have been you know teaching or should I have been doing something completely different with my life and so I was really at that end I was really questioning myself and my self-worth and at the start of the business it was a lot of hard work and a lot of financial stress but I was still really confident about the path that we had chosen and the other thing is like every single day people come in the store and they're like oh I love this store mm -hmm. and that's like so much more affirming mm -hmm. now that I own the store mm -hmm. than it ever was there's new work now because the business is growing and you know we have like part-timers and so I have to manage other people mm -hmm. and there are other skills that I have to put into place yeah. that are not my strength. In some respects I feel like I'm working harder now than I was the first two years. That there's that. <laughs> it doesn't like. But it seems like you're okay reason, with it. For some reason, I thought maybe there would be like just a little bit of easing. But yeah. <laughs> no. no. Meanwhile, your sister has the day off. <laughs> I have Monday off. So okay. It, it's good. fair. Good. It's very it evens fair. Out. <laughs> Because customers may not have wanted a change to the shop, Laura opened a new place to rebuild. Now Mia from Stone Fence figured out she could just move and find new people. And then she would invite others to spread the word. Like changing your artistic tastes and style. Sometimes you just have to go where the others might like it too. Well I knew I could do it because I'd been doing most everything at that point anyways. And I didn't want to do anything else so I just felt like okay I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this. and, and I think it'll work. So you already had kind of the experience of running the place. Right. What does what does that entail? A That's little bit of everything. I mean, you do the purchasing, you do the human resources. I do have an accountant, but I do a lot of it myself also. So you kind of wear all the hats. Okay. How do, how do you find the people that you brought in? Or how did you initially go, hey, I, artists? Well, I knew a lot of people. I do. I know a lot of artists. My husband and I have spent the last 30 years, we've known a lot of artists. It seems the theme is whether it's something horrible or great. So far, the thing that makes people decide to do it is something happened in their life while they were thinking about it. Here's Sarah from 11000. At some point, you just do it. Okay. So I analyzed it, I think, for probably two or three years. I did all the things that you should do where you decide how much money you need to survive per month and cut back on things to start to prepare 
but you never really know what it's going to feel like until you just do it. I think a lot of the practice of getting ready to start the business for me was starting to become comfortable with uncertainty, which I'm still not completely comfortable with, but you just have to learn how to cope with it because you're starting something from scratch and you're the only person holding you accountable. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I am married, so my partner, you know, I had a lot of conversations with my partner about what this could look like and what it means because I was the breadwinner in the family and so what that would mean for us. Talked about it logically, but then then you just decide you're just going to do it. Just do it. Do you mean the sole breadwinner or comparatively you made more than Comparatively. He comparatively, yeah. okay. Yeah. I was up for a promotion at my job and I was at this place where the next level up was like really getting into higher level money and I knew it was a pivotal point for me. Financially, I'm at this point where we're really comfortable, but if we made a lot less, it would be okay. But if I make that next level amount of money, I think I could really get sucked in. And we could maybe, if we have kids, then we're like really sucked in and tied into this money. And so I didn't get the job. I was like the finalist for a promotion and my gut the whole time was telling me like, you've got something you want to do now is the time you should do it. But I was like still sucked into the system. Mm -hmm. And so when I didn't get it, it was like the clincher like, okay, universe, I'm going to listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm just going to try it now because I don't have as much to lose. And so I did it. I actually had a couple of different business ideas, so I didn't know which one I was going to do. I knew I wanted a business, I had some good ideas, and then I did some life coaching, which I never thought I would do. Wait, I wait, didn't wait. do life coaching, I got life coaching. Okay, that was yeah. what I was gonna yeah. ask. It yeah. was like all of a sudden you're yeah. just like, I'm gonna coach yeah. people. No, no. Okay. When I quit my job, I actually utilized my 10 years of marketing experience and did do some marketing consulting, which I still do sometimes. But during that time, I ended up meeting Michelle, who's a life coach, and that really was a catalyst for me to help ask myself the right questions in terms of what do I really want to do. So I actually started writing business plans for a couple of different ideas, figured out that this is what I was, this was the idea that I was most scared about and most passionate about. The other idea was really, really smart and I might still do it at some point, but I was like not as excited about it. And so I think passion ends up being like 70% of it, right? Because it's really, really hard. And so if you don't really feel excited and in love with it, I don't think it's going to be successful no matter what. There was a fly that kept trying to land on our faces while I was talking to the next group of people. And as the interview went on, we kept swinging at it during the recording. Then at one point, Leah, out of nowhere, slaps the table and startles me in the process. All right. Oh, wow. She's a ninja. That was impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, back to what we were doing. Fear is a factor that anyone putting themselves out there is familiar with. That's what kept Leah from Booth 121 from starting right away. My first craft show and seeing that the response of people and how much I sold and that I could actually make a living doing this. And yeah. that was what gave me the response. Because I, I was people said, well, you should do a show, you should do a show. And I was always afraid of the negative response. People mm -hmm. coming up to me like, oh, that's you know, awful. So that kept me, that held me back for a long time. But yeah. then I just decided to take the plunge. And I did, and I had a, a great response. So then I was like, okay. Then I just yeah. threw my, all my time and energy into it. I did both jobs for a year and a half, both of them full time. Okay. I would spend 40 hours at Dean, 40 hours doing, you know, painting. The demand was there. And but then one day it was just like, okay, this... It was after that craft show, and I saw how much money I made, and, and that if I could devote more time to it, I could make more money, and... <laughs> what made yeah. you decide to go, well, you st said you're still doing the bar, but what made you go, yeah, hell with it, I'll do this too? We were just talking. We yeah. were just, like, hanging out, talking one day, and I knew what she wanted to do, I mean, and my was son was getting older, so I, I kind of went to bartending so I could be at home with my son during the day. So I could have Oliver, her son, during yeah. the day, and then another friend's daughter during the day, you know, kind of to take care of the kids and be the mom and still go to work at night, and that was good. But everyone was getting older. No one else was going to have any more babies for me to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also time just to get out of the house and to not be at work every night till 3 a.m. and do something. She's so passionate about what she does, and she's so great at it that it's good to be a part of that. We did this without taking out any loans. Really? So, yeah, 
There's You're the first one I've talked to that said that. Okay, yeah. like, tell me about this then. Starting out with consignment. We didn't have any wholesale stuff. The only thing, few, few cards. greeting cards were, were the only things that we had wholesale. Huh. We didn't have to, besides what I painted, besides the actual brick and mortar, we didn't have to put any money into buying product. product. Yeah. So we had people bring it in. We didn't have to buy it from them. As it sold, we paid them a portion of it. As a consignment store, I had my stuff in some other consignment stores, and they wanted 50% of what I brought to them. You can't make any money doing that. So mm -hmm. we wanted to make the consignment rate very appealable to to the vendors coming in. So we checked around and made it so people could actually yeah. make money having mm -hmm. their product here oh. versus just put it in there for someone to buy their stuff, not get any profit from it, basically. Yeah. And have a storefront all the time that's open, not yeah. just to have the people wait for the craft shows to see their, their product. So you just bought the building? Well, we didn't buy the building. We rent it. We still rent it. Up until... This year, end of March, we were only on half the like building, which is this side here. So How does that work? I know. Uh, the business that was in this side left, and they were supposed to be here longer, and that was our goal then to, once their lease was up, then to take over the whole building. They left a little earlier than we were expecting. After the holiday season though, that we had last year, seeing the demand and sales <laughs> basically yeah. we're like okay we have something here it was rough going so for the first yeah. couple months because okay. we didn't have a ton of vendors or a ton of product to sell but as people heard of us a lot of people would approach us about bringing stuff in and I feel like we really have the right mix of vendors now and that I think has really helped us and that would explain the other store that I walked into in the back when I was like how far yeah. back does this place go right yeah. I didn't know if we had necessarily enough product to take up the entire whole building we had that space in the back and we were brainstorming on what to do with it and we'll hold workshops well there that's only gonna happen every once in a while so I approached uh, Allison is her name and her shop is called Candy Buckingham's and it was just down the street which is an adorable name by the way I know <laughs> the funny story is is it's her first animal in the street she grew, grew up on. So I'm like, <laughs> your stripper name. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. I was just going to say, that, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah. that the formula? It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so Rebecca offered to help Leah with her skill set just to give her the push that she needed, which just goes to show you don't have to be creative to get involved. If you remember, Micah from the Yellow Rose was just a person attending the events at the Yellow Rose Gallery, not a creator. And he got involved because of his knowledge of nonprofits. And Demetrius was a creator, but was able to offer how to help kids in outreach programs. Being an artist and having my own business before I became executive director, that's something that I was already doing. What Again, was the business? The business that I used to do before, I used to teach 2D animation. I also used to teach web comics. So I had a web comic series. I was the artist, the writer, the promoter. Everything was all pretty much based on me. Uh, get you accustomed to take on pretty much uh, challenges once you uh, focus on that conquer that then you can move on to the next. Having 20 artists under myself, I'm a family man, I've been married for 17 years. I have six kids. Wow. Oldest son is 19 years old. My youngest son is 13 years old. So they range between 13 and 19. So I've also been trained over the years on how to deal with all types of personalities. I take that and I apply it to the expectations here at the gallery. You know, having artists under you, you want, to, you want them to feel comfortable and you want them to feel that the time that they're spending here is worth the time that they receive some type of reward afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a hard industry, so that's pretty much my take on I didn't mean to sputter wow when you said six kids, but I mean, I, I have two, and that's a pain. <laughs> oh, man. Four boys and two girls. Oh, man. started a nonprofit in the past so I had a good idea of the amount of time required given that I was more of like the behind the scenes person I was trying to help them transition from a for-profit to nonprofit model I had a pretty good sense of how much effort that would take and how much time it would take for me I had already written in the past articles of incorporation and bylaws and that sort of thing so I knew that I could template so I was able to make the leap because I knew it wasn't gonna take me that much time it's only been a year I think mm -hmm. since we started this yeah. movement into the nonprofit realm. I was going to say, I only recently heard about this place, so I was yeah. wondering how long it had been around. The gallery's been around for four years, I think. Really? Yeah, but most of it was 
as a for-profit. Now, do you both do this all the time, or do you have other jobs or means? Yeah, so this is all volunteer work for me. So, okay. Um, I, I work uh, in information security. Oh, yeah, nice. I, I focus on vulnerability management. So okay. that's what I do um, for my job. And for myself, well, this is what I do. I'm here, if I'm not at home, being creative, doing my own projects. I'm at home pretty much focusing out on how to manage the Yellow Rose guy. Tammy from the Hatch Art House had a plan to help sell other artists' work and conduct her place like the gallery that she always imagined and consigned everything in the shop from others. She never questioned it. She just waited until she had enough money. Gosh, it was just that turning point. I, I was working really hard, and I felt like I had a pretty good nest egg, and I, it was just like an epiphany. Like, okay, I'm ready. We're hearing Let's that do it. A lot. I know. So brave. That's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, it, it, it kind of was, but I've never been that person that really thought too much about it. I would just, this is what I really want, and you hope that your friends and family are behind you, but if they're not, then it's more of like, well, I'm just going to do the best that I can and, and hopefully prove them wrong. You still needed your tips and everything to live, so how were you planning for this <laughs> big move as it was going along? My business plan, so to speak, for Hatch was, I thought, still think is pretty solid, and it was to do everything on a serious shoestring budget. It's run just like a regular art gallery, a typical art gallery, I should say, where everything is on consignment. Mm -hmm. So the artists all own the work until it sells, and then they get paid. So I don't own any of the work. They get paid once a month. So that was, I didn't have to buy a ton of stuff. Oh. All it, and then of course all the furniture and all that kind of stuff is was either mine or I got it at Finney's or there's a lot of stuff that I found on the curb. Okay, so really all you needed to do was cover the cost of the building. Anastasia of Confectionique ran out of space for her stuff. So she took the idea of the annual shows she attended and made that her store, only hosting quarterly events which was a very different way to go about opening a place. She even started taking local vendors with her when she went to Paris to restock, so they could do it too. I was constantly making things for other people, or I was in shows, or I was rearranging my own house, painting, repainting, dragging in furniture, taking furniture out, reupholstering, just constant. And my husband finally said, we can't fit another thing in this house. And if we could please not repaint a room for a while, that would be great. So I, an opportunity came up at the time with my business partner, and we just decided this space was available and let's, let's try opening a shop. I mean, it was just a matter of I needed to get out of my basement. I needed to get out of being just in a traditional booth, and I needed to be in a more formal setting. And the reason why I do monthly markets, again, that was out of necessity. I was working full-time as a social worker, just didn't have the time to devote to be at a space every day. That's why I created this whole concept of maybe I'll make it feel more like Paris because when you go to a Paris market on the weekends typically, you honestly never know what you're going to find. And so that concept I, I do here where... I close down and I revamp the shop under a different theme and people come back. To them it feels like, wow, I'm visiting a different shop in Paris or I'm visiting a different market in Paris. Yeah. So that's kind of how that whole concept developed. What kind of stuff were you making? You said you were, you were making things before this. I'm always a kind of a found objects person. I've always been, find a whole, a lot of old boxes and I would decoupage them and put glitter on them with little French sayings and baskets lined with fabric that I felt looked like French fabric. Where would you find them? Found objects, sometimes in Paris. There's a guy that we call the Euro Man, and he has um, bins and bins and bins and bins of old stuff for a euro a piece. So it's like his own version of the dollar store. His own version of the <laughs> old dollar store. Okay. That's right. So we'll sometimes go see Euro Man and we'll see what he has. But Estate sales, I don't do estate sales around here. I mainly do them in northern Wisconsin. So that's one thing. And then I've developed quite a few vendors in Paris that are friends that will contact me if they have something that they think I could use. I have contacts in northern Wisconsin that contact me. I like to buy LOTs of things 
What's that? Lots. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why I call them LOTs, but I call it them sounds, LOTs. Because it makes it sound like it was, I'm like, is this some it's term I've never heard of? <laughs> it's an Anastasia term. It's an LOT. <laughs> so I buy LOTs. For example, there was a restaurant that closed down, and they uh, somebody brought gave, asked me if I wanted to buy this whole thing of sugar, I mean, um, syrup, yeah. old-fashioned syrup containers. And I have people coming in so excited because... They make syrup at home, and so they come in and buy syrup containers. Yeah. So I have regular everyday stuff, but then I have the women that are just die-hard lovers of all things French fabric, French buttons, French lace. I bring all of those kinds of things back, and they come in specifically to shop for French fabrics and lace and buttons because they're because they make things. <laughs> How did you plan for it? Probably, I would have to say, is a, a shoestring shop. Even all the furniture is secondhand and painted. It was just kind of a little bit every year. My husband and I just would look at my at our budget and can we put a little bit of money in to update something? And so we did a little something with the floor, and I had something designed here in the back. But in general, it's it's just been a slow thing. It wasn't we're going to put a an incredible amount of money toward this project to start and then open. It was, no, we'll just open with a cobbled together shop and build upon it, which is, which is the way we chose to do it. Now, Anastasia said before that she went full-time after she retired. Kyle from Pieces Unimagined started after he retired from the church he was at. But he chose to retire specifically to start this place. So was it that simple for him? When I retired from ministry, I knew what I was going to do. And uh, Madison is a funny town when it comes to real estate. I come from north suburbs of Chicago mm. in Lake Geneva area. And finding property is easy there. Here, it's a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a full year to find a piece of property wow. that would actually fit what we wanted to do. Where were you looking? Everywhere. 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 Yeah. I was okay. on East Johnson. I was on State, on Atwood. Very difficult mm. to get it affordably and a good location. Mm -hmm. And so I did find that to be a real challenge. You finished with the church and you were, now's the time. Yep. That, that was it. It was just like, it was that done. <laughs> okay. For me, I was buying and selling stuff when I was nine. Age 12, we'd have garage sales. A buddy of mine would have garage sales, and there'd be like traffic jams. The cops would have to direct traffic. So just helping people access stuff is not a big deal for me. So you just kind of let it happen. Don't force things. Uh, the, the main thing I forced was location. Willie Street Co-op was my, my anchor. Instead of having a stray address for us, um, we're able to just say, we're right across from the Willie Street Co-op, and there is no mistaking where we're at. So that was highly purposeful. Yeah. And that's what made finding property hard. So maybe that answer, that clarifies it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Location, location, location was very important mm -hmm. because when it comes to art, you have to have walk-through traffic. Mm -hmm. People don't come, in, you know, come to a store because they're going to find this particular piece of art. You have to stumble on that art, so you have to have foot traffic. I had a little saved up, but really didn't have that much. Really? Yeah, it really wasn't that kind of, huh. kind of venture. No, it's, okay. it's, not, it's not a highly moneyed thing. John at Mother Fools worked at the Willie Street Co-op, and the co-owner, Stephanie, worked at the Greenpeace offices. There was a shift happening at work for both of them, and they took it as a sign. There was some shifting in my department, and I didn't want to move into a different position. You know, so I think I was kind of looking for an exit from there. Stephanie was the director of the local Greenpeace office, and if I remember the timing right, they had just offered her a year sabbatical. You know, so I think those two factors allowed us to say, let's take this leap and do it. So it just kind of aligned. For Tammy at Bohemian Bobble, she started to explain earlier that layoffs at her old job made her take the leap. I asked her again to explain more how that helped her decide. You were ready to make the leap after a voluntary layoff, you said? That yeah. sounds that sounds like a polite way of putting it. They, no, it's a real it was a real thing. They okay. were like, you can either take a layoff and we'll give you, we'll offer you this package deal. So they did offer you. Okay. Yeah. Or we're gonna bump you out of your position. Yeah. Because it was a, a union shop. 
So someone that was higher in seniority than me bumped me out of my position, and I could either take a different position that I did not want, yeah. or I could take the voluntary layoff. And I was like, bring me the layoff. It's, see, I've yeah. only ever been fired, so I don't know yeah. what the what this layoff thing entails. Yeah, it was it was all foreign to me at the time. What mm -hmm. field did you work in? Health insurance. Health insurance, okay. Yeah. I had had a shot before this happened. You did? While I was still working full time, I had a shop right down the street from where I live called the Bohemian Bauble. And it was my jewelry and I sold the art of a bunch of other local artists. And it was kind of like a co-op where I didn't have any employees, but the people who wanted to sell their art there had to work a couple shifts a month in exchange for selling their items. Oh, okay. And we made that work for six years. I look back now and I have no idea how I made it work because I was working practically full-time at my at my day job still and I had two little kids mm -hmm. but I I did it for six years it was an awesome experience I knew when it was time to to let it go and then I closed and then I got offered the layoff oh okay like, yeah nine months later all right but it wouldn't have mattered anyway I think even um like I didn't feel like oh geez now I ha I'm gonna have all this time if I want to be at the shop mm -hmm. well the shop was gone by then and I was fine with it is it really that is it just one little thing to convince you to take a chance on what you do? Is anyone else out there terrified by that answer? What kind of chances am I not taking big or small? Am I missing out on something? Next week, we're going to find out how long did they give themselves to succeed? Did they have a plan, an exit strategy? Some of the answers may surprise you. May not. I don't know. I'd like to thank you for listening to the show. And if this is your first time hearing the podcast, you can subscribe at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. And while you're at the website, you can read my daily comic blog. I don't write, but I draw comics. So each day, I post something that happened in my life. The background music is provided by my side project, Romcom. You can hear the original versions of these songs at AmericanBandito.com slash music. I'll be back next week to find out more about how these creatives decided to go one step further with their careers. Until then, see you next time. So long.